Good evening, and welcome to La Trobe University's Bold Thinking series event, A Joint Effort, Understanding What's Good for Your Joints. I'm Dr. Wade Kelly, the Senior Coordinator of Research Impact here at La Trobe University, and I'll be your panel moderator this evening. We're delighted to be joining you from the newly opened La Trobe Sports Park. We're one of the first events to be in this beautiful new space, and in time, the sports park will become a leading uh, sport and recreation destination of choice for Melbourne's north, uh, including grassroots, communities, and elite level sports. Uh, in addition, the sports park is a world-class, world-leading uh, teaching, learning, and research hub for sports and exercise science. So welcome. It now gives me great pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Russ Hoy, who's the Dean of the School of Allied Health, Human Services, and Sports, to kick off our event. Professor Hoy. Thanks, Wade. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, La Trobe University acknowledges that this event and our participants are located on the lands of many traditional custodians in Australia. We recognise their ongoing connection to the land and value their unique contribution to the university and wider Australian society. We are committed to providing opportunities for Indigenous Australians, both as individuals and communities, through teaching and learning, research and community partnerships across all our campuses and online. We pay our respects to Indigenous, Indigenous Elders, past, present and emerging, and extend this respect to any Indigenous participants joining us online this evening. Tonight's event brings together world-class experts from La Trobe University and the Australian Ballet to explore an all too common issue, joint pain, particularly in relation to knees and hips. Our purpose tonight is to showcase the world-leading collaborative research that's underway through the partnership between the Australian Ballet and La Trobe University, a partnership that is now in its fifth year. Our research and learning partnership with the Australian Ballet brings together experts in sports medicine to deliver world-leading research and the potential to improve health outcomes across the community. This partnership presents exciting opportunities in generating new knowledge and skills for injury prevention that will be of benefit to the dance and broader sporting community and tonight's event will share that knowledge with all of you online. Uh, beyond research, our partnership with the Australian Ballet has many facets. La Trobe's Elite Athlete Program allows elite dancers to complete tertiary study while meeting their on-stage obligations. Preparing for a life beyond the main stage, the Australian Ballet's dancers are supported with La Trobe's Career Ready workshops to, to, to develop the necessary skills for planning their future careers beyond their dance uh, career. La Trobe students studying a range of disciplines from health sciences to cyber security gain access to exclusive internship opportunities at the Australian Ballet, one of Australia's great art organisations. So it's with great pleasure that I open this evening's event and trust that you find the presentations and discussions uh, useful and fruitful. Thank you, Wade. Thank you very much, Russ. So tonight we're going to hear from four different panellists covering a wide range of topics. There are Professor Jill Cook, Dr. Sue Mays, Professor Kay Crossley, and Amber Scott with the Australian Ballet. And we're going to kick things off right there with Amber, who's going to be talking a little bit about her experience as a ballet dancer, because I think what better way to start a night like tonight than with a story. So with that, from the Australian Ballet, Amber Scott, I kick it over to you. Or plie it over to you? I'm not sure what the right <laughs> term is. Thank you, Wade. <laughs> they all work. Um, yes, my name's Amber Scott, and I'm a principal artist with the Australian Ballet. I'm in my 20th year with the company, which is um, amazing, actually. I, I'm so grateful that I've been able to have a really long career and um, so many incredible experiences along the way. Um, because it's been quite a long journey, I have had my share of injuries, as is fairly expected for a career that's um, combining you know, elite, elite athleticism as well as artistry. And one of the, the big injuries I had that um, it was quite formative for me because it taught me a lot about my body. Um, back in 2007, I developed a lot of hip pain and it was in my right hip, which is a leg that we use all the time for classical ballet as our, we call it our gesture leg. It's the pretty leg um, that we kick up in the air a lot. So it sort of built up over a while and then by the end of that year, um, I couldn't really, I couldn't lift it at all. I think in a show I felt something quite painful happen and, um, and then I was pretty much like 
lying down and not able to move much at all and it was quite worrying but I um, fortunately had a fantastic medical team to reassure me that they'd seen this before, it it's happens with dancers, it happens with the general population and they helped me through it. So um, for a young dancer, I was on, um, it was a really important time in my career. I was starting to get some exciting roles and I was pushing a lot. So it was um, a really bad time for me to have this happen. And I, I was quite impatient to have to stop at that point, but it was actually the best thing because it made me learn so much more about the way uh, joints work and in particular the hip joint, which is so important to um, ballet dancers, not just to look beautiful, but for your strength. And it's the, you know, hip strength is the basis of our technique. So I went from um, not being able to like put my pants on or even lift my leg off the floor. I was sort of, I could stand up or lie down but sitting, I couldn't sit. So I thought, how on earth am I going to be able to do a ballet ever again? And it just seemed like a long, a long journey. But um, we took a really conservative approach and one that um, made me be very patient, which uh, now I can see was uh, really important for me as a person. So I learned all about deep rotator muscles. Um, I had to strengthen a lot of the, the really deep muscles. I, I didn't even understand how, um, pelvic floor worked until I had this injury and it there was just a lot of um, learning along the way and stripping back um, the big exciting movements of ballet and going into a uh, really refined um, control of all the, the deep muscles and then retraining in a way that would be good for my um, body long term and amazingly after a lot of patience and it was um, you know sometimes I got a bit frustrated and I was worried I wasn't going to reach, you know, back to a level where I was happy with. Um, I ended up being able to perform Swan Lake um, probably about three months later than the initial um, uh, injury, which was mainly a lot of swelling. But yeah, I was, I was really proud to achieve that because I, I didn't know if that was going to be possible, um, especially at the beginning, like I had an MRI and I think there was a, just a really long document in the report that listed a lot of issues and I saw it and I was like oh this is a disaster I'm never going to dance again but you know now I I really don't have any issues with my hip at all I'm so I'm so lucky but I do have to keep an eye on it because I've noticed when I stop and I take a holiday or I um, I don't do as much classical work those muscles that I learnt about they they need to be worked they won't just do it for themselves. Sometimes I can feel hip pain come back. And now, because I have that knowledge, I don't get frightened of it. I just um, use it as a reminder that it's time to go and do some work on my um, my turnout muscles and, and everything that I've been taught um, by the medical team. So yeah, it's been a, a really good experience to um, help me become more autonomous and to take care of myself and even when I've had other joint injuries um, over the years, I've felt that the approach I learnt from my hip injury has helped me that way. And a lot of it is um, how you approach things psychologically. And uh, yeah, not letting the, f the fear of the pain overwhelm you, but to understand it and um, do everything you can to get on top of that. And I think having a sense of owning your um, your injury or your your area of weakness, I think that's really, really important because it always makes you feel better when you can take charge of something yourself. So yeah, I'm, I'm still here, I'm still dancing and hopefully for um, some more years, we've had a little bit of a enforced period of time. Um, all the dancers in the Australian Ballet have been working from home and it's been a really nice time. Um, We've all re-evaluated our work and we've spent a lot of time doing body conditioning to maintain the level that we um, need to to be professional dancers and when we return, um, we'll be ready for that, hopefully.
Thank you, Amber. That was fantastic. I, I think maybe in the question and answer session, there might be some questions about what people could be doing at home um, as dancers or as individuals to keep active and to keep their bodies in motion. So we're going to move right along to Professor Jill Cook. Jill Cook is a physiotherapist at La Trobe University, a researcher who's inspired to keep positive, uh, to keep people active and healthy, particularly their tendons, which I feel like I'm never going to get to give that intro again, particularly <laughs> their tendons. Thank you very much, Wade, and welcome everybody and to my esteemed panel members. My role tonight is to set the scene, especially for the people in the audience who are not clinicians. To do that, I'm going to briefly talk about what a normal joint is, what happens in pathology, how we diagnose it, and what those diagnostic uh, tests mean for how we might manage our joint. So let's go to what is a normal joint. The really important thing is that there's a lot of variation in how joints are formed and what activity they do. And most of this depends on the load the joint has to take and they can sustain very high loads or some joints sustain actually very little load. So if we think about joints through the body, there's joints that take a lot of impact such as the knee, which has to land from jumping but also change direction. We have joints that have a lot of movement in them. The shoulder is a joint that has to place our arm in space in a very wide arc. And so that joint is designed to take movement. We have joints that are set for repetition. And if you think about our wrist and finger joints, you can imagine that they're active virtually all day, every day, because we're picking up things and moving them. And these joints, because of their different loads that are placed on them, can be more or less stable. And you can see here from the pictures that the hip joint is a ball and socket joint. You can see that the ball fits inside the socket very well. So we have a lot of bony stability in a hip joint. The shoulder is also a ball and socket joint. It has a large ball, but you can see that the socket is actually very, very small. And so even though they're configured in the same way, they actually have a lot of different stability patterns to them. So we know that the stability can come from the bones, more or less, depending on the joint. But we also have a lot of ligaments and muscles and tendons around a joint that help us with our stability. So if we look at a normal joint, what we can see is we have two bone ends and we have cartilage on the ends of the bone. We can have additional cartilage structures and we'll talk about joints like the knee that have a menisci, but we have um, discs in other joints such as our the joints of our collarbone, the joints of our jaw, and in fact, some cartilage in the our hip joint as well. Around these bony ends, we have a joint capsule to allow easy movement and to keep fluid inside the joint that makes movement frictionless. And we don't have very much fluid in a normal joint. Around those structures, we have ligaments to support the stability. And these are the ligaments that give us static support in our joint. So if we think about the knee joint and we try and move it sideways, we can't. And that's because the ligaments are very strong and prevent that movement and stop it moving excessively. But over the top of the ligaments, we have muscles and tendons that run over the joint and, and give extra stability. Now, these muscles and tendons give us a dynamic stability. That is, when we are changing direction and running, it's the muscles and tendons that add to the stability of the ligaments and keep the, the joints very stable. So what happens in pathology? And there's lots of pathologies that can happen in, in joints, but we're going to talk mostly today about what we call arthritis in, in less technical terms. We're going to particularly focus on osteoarthritis. So what happens in the joint is we see a lot of change within the structure of the joint. We see a loss of cartilage. It can either become thin or it can be actually become uh, absent. We see swelling in the joint. So you might see that clinically. You, you can actually see the swelling um, in the joint itself or you can detect that on imaging. And we can get extra bone in and around a joint in response to the changes that we see in the cartilage and in the joint swelling. What doesn't change and what's going to be critical for how we manage our joints is that our ligament support and our muscle and tendon support that give us stability in the joint actually remain the same. So what causes arthritis? We know that aging is uh, associated with arthritis, but it's not a question of developing arthritis because you're old, you develop arthritis because of load accumulation through your life. So as you get older, you've exposed your joint to more and more 
load, therefore you have the potential to have um, a change in your joint cartilage and your joint movements. Okay, we have a ch also have a change in the capacity for the joint to repair. So as we get older, our cells become a little less capable of responding to load. And in fact, we can't respond as well when we're a bit older. Injury causes joint damage with either a fracture or actually a ligament tear. And our biggest cause of knee joint arthritis from injury is a cruciate ligament tear. So we see that very often. And of course, we have disease such as inflammatory conditions such as rheumatoid arthritis, which we won't be talking about tonight. There's now going to be a poll that you can see on your screen and we'd love you to actually vote on whether you think the, uh, the changes in your joint imaging are important to how you might manage your joint. So you have three options there, not important, important or very important. And I'm going to go on now and talk about how we image joints and what that might mean. So we can diagnose arthritis clinically through pain in the joint, swelling in the joint, and stiffness from the swelling. And you can actually get what's called crepitus or noises in the joint when you move. What happens if you have all these things, you tend to unload your joint and you get a loss of function. And we'll talk about what that means. You can also diagnose your arthritis with an X-ray on MRI. And you can see the pictures of an X-ray here. You can see a loss of joint space. You can see the changes in the cartilage. And on MRI, you can see the swelling in the joint and all sorts of bony changes that might be associated with it. So what does it mean? What do your images mean? Are we have, do we have the poll results now? The question was, how important do you think joint images are for management of joint pain? And uh, not important, important, or very important. And I don't know Still what you've said yet. Still don't have the so. poll questions. That's all right. Um, we'll move we'll on, on because yeah. I'm actually going to tell you whether they're important or not. So you actually oh. don't need to vote on that question. So there we go. We've got important as 41%. Okay. So that's interesting. About half of you think that they might be important. So here's the real answer to that question. Images and changes on the image, so arthritis on your MRI or X-ray, do not mean that the joint is necessarily painful. We have many people in the community who have profound joint damage that's seen on imaging who never have pain. And the other thing about images is they don't tell you that the joint is the source of your pain and they can't tell you whether you re can recover and become pain free and fully functional. So overall, your images are not that important in determining your outcome from arthritis. And you can see this clearly. This is a, a, a sort of a, a caricature of many studies that have looked at asymptomatic people and looked at how many people actually have changes on their images that don't have, uh, that do have changes on their x-ray. And to focus on the hips and the knee, you can see in the hips, there's a cam and what's called cam and pincer morphology. This is a change in the structure of the bones in the joint that predispose you to arthritis. And you can see there's a very high percentage of people who have these changes, but have no symptoms. And those cartilage plates or that cartilage rim in the hip joint can be damaged in two thirds of people and never give you pain. The same thing you can see in the knee, you can see cartilage changes either at the joint level or in that meniscus or cartilage plate without people, with people not having symptoms. So what can we change? Clinically, we can improve pain and stiffness and loss of function so that it's easy for you to become active in your sport or just to be active in your daily activities by making you functionally better, by improving those structures that give you stability and strength around your joint, particularly your muscles. What doesn't change is your imaging. The only thing that will change your imaging is a joint replacement, and a joint replacement's really very good for most people, but there are people who have a joint replacement and have persistent pain and loss of function, so it's not necessarily the answer. I'm now gonna hand over to my other colleagues who will talk about how it affects high level sports and how we manage things clinically. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Jill. I mean, it's, you know, it's very interesting that the poll result, 41% thought it was important, and yet the research may indicate a very different picture. And so we're gonna talk more about that as the panel continues on throughout the night. Just a reminder to get your questions in there as they pop into your head, type them in, and we'll try and get to them uh, as we go through tonight. Uh, 
To provide insights now into what we learned from dancers, we're going to hear from Sue Mays. Sue's skill and dedication as the principal physiotherapist for the Australia Ballet keeps dancers dancing across our stages and, for the moment, our screens. But before I hand it over to Sue, uh, we thought it would be good to give you a little idea just how extreme the demands are on ballet dancers to, 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 to communicate that beauty. There's so much going on. So here's some footage from the Australian ballet, including Amber. So after you've seen that vote, that uh, ballet on the video, I'd like you to answer this poll question. So the question is, do you think being a ballet dancer would put your joints at greater risk of damage? So either answer yes or no to that. So while we're waiting for the answer to your poll questions, I'd just like to say that Amber didn't tell you the whole story that I think I'm really amazed at what she can do. She's actually got a little toddler and uh, she still manages, her and her husband, who is also a principal dancer, Ty, managed to fit all their conditioning and their busy professional ballet life in amongst looking after a toddler as well. So it's really incredible and I really thank Amber for her amazing story that she's been happy to share tonight. So the, the real priority for us at the Australian Ballet is to make sure our dancers have healthy and um, hips, not only during their career, but also after when they retire. And when we partnered with La Trobe University, an absolute priority for us was to research the hip health in our professional ballet dancers. Now, most would assume, especially after seeing the video that you saw, that that loading that they do through their hips is really quite damaging. They take their hips through extreme ranges of movement. They do a lot of jumping. The men do heavy lifting in the partnering that they do. They also, we know that the hips get impinged, so there's an impingement or abutment of the joint that can potentially lead to damage. There's some subluxation, which is an excessive movement through the joint. And also we know that the dancers, like other athletic, aesthetic athletes, love to sit in sort of side splits in these extreme positions for long periods of time. Now, all these levels of extreme loading on the hip joint really could lead to injury and potentially osteoarthritis. So are dancers at risk of osteoarthritis? We used magnetic resonance imaging to evaluate the pathology or the findings around the hip joint. And we we're amazed that at least 50% of our dancers had even just one of these features. So we found so much of these findings in the hip joints. Nearly all of our dancers had at least one of these features that are usually associated with osteoarthritis in their hip joint. So if we looked at their imaging alone, we would really assume that dancers are bound to get arthritic hips when they get older. However, we did notice that the prevalence of these features increased as they get older, and we also compared this to athletes. And we found there was actually no difference in the prevalence of these features in the dancers and athletes. So as Jill was saying, these features are often found in people without any pain, and our findings certainly supported that, uh, those other, the other research that's been done. So we found that there was no relationship between the imaging findings on the MRI and the dancers or the athletes' hip pain. We did find one feature that was associated, and a fusion synovitis, which is the swelling around a joint, was certainly related to the dancers' pain. And this is, some, this is something that can be very adequately managed with modifying their workload, perhaps some anti-inflammatories, and also strengthening the joint so that it's not excessively moving so much. But uh, then we, was really, we really wanted to see the impact of the professional ballet dancing on the hip, the hip joints. And so we followed the dancers over five years. And at the end of the five years, we re-MRI'd their hips. 
and we found that the dancer's hips did not change over the time. So the cartilage remained stable and that it's the cartilage that can often deteriorate with arthritis. In fact, we've had no hip injuries that have caused a dancer to miss a performance or training for eight years. We've, in the last 15 years, we've not had to do any hip surgery and a dancer hasn't retired due to hip pain. So I think if you look at all this evidence, it really supports the idea that ballet dancing is not bad for your hips and hips can really cope with its extreme loading. So why is it that this, uh, the ballet dancers can cope with this loading? Perhaps they've got strong muscles, ideal anatomy, and ballet targets the hip joints at, from such a young age. So we also, as a team, looked at the size of the muscles around the hips of dancers and athletes, and we found that dancers had strong hip muscles, and so that's probably pretty protective. And this iliopsoas, which is the muscle at the front of the hip, which is an important hip stabiliser, so it helps protect the hip, but it's also a really important muscle for holding that leg up that they do to the extreme heights. We found that this muscle was actually smaller in um, people with hip pain. So it seems like a really important muscle to target. We also found that when we measured the bony anatomy of the dancers, that they actually had a really unique shape that might be ideal for ballet. So they had these nice spherical femoral heads with narrow necks, and then they had this um, angulation of their femur that uh, meant that it probably allows a lot more movement than the gen you know, general pop population can do. They also had cups or acetabulum that face more out to the side, which can allow that external rotation or that turnout movement that they do um, throughout their ballet technique. So all these features are probably pretty protective and allow them to do these movements without getting damaged. And ballet itself has really specific loading that I think actually could be quite protective for a dancer. So the great thing is they load their hip joints very specifically from a young age right through their career. And this loading is very gradually increased in its volume and in its complexity, which is a really sensible thing to do to the joint to build up some tolerance to the extreme loading that they do. They also use their hip joints through full range of movement, which is a healthy thing to do. They do a lot of jumping and from a very young age they do small jumping and it gradually builds up its complexity and height as they get older as well. And they do lots of balancing on one leg and we know balance training is great for joints. And they develop such precise control and they can control the end of movement. But I think most importantly ballet is a non-contact activity. And unlike football, for example, there's no, there's very rarely do we see traumatic injuries. And it's those traumatic injuries that can lead on to damage injury. So at the Australian Ballet, we've been really successful in managing and preventing hip injury. And a key to that is the strengthening those muscles around the hip. The dancers, when they're employed, all get a hip program. They do it before their training in the morning. Then they do some high resistance training after their, um, at the end of their day. But we also don't let them rest completely. Generally, we can modify their workload and they'll um, be able to keep jumping. Often the jumping, the small jumping, is really fine for the hips. We might not get them to do what Arco's doing here, but um, we'll certainly um, get them to do some jumping that keeps all those muscles going strong. We'll give them some education on safe stretching so that they're not pushing their hips into those extreme ranges and we'll also make sure that they keep up their exercises when they retire. But I hear there's some poll results coming through. Oh, so here we go. 59 for yes. 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 And 41 no. That's right. 59 yes. So you, most of you or more than half thought that perhaps ballet dancing could injure a joint. So I think what we're saying actually the dancers can cope, but we'll get to that. So what are we doing now with our ballet research? We're evaluating, we're using motion capture to evaluate the um, hip motion during ballet class. We're also trying to work out if, we, if the hip pain that they might be feeling is affecting their technique or their performance. And we're also really still trying to work out what muscles are the most important ones to target. And now we've also gone on to study the hip, the joints health around the foot and ankle. So what can we all learn from these um, ballet hips? What we can learn is that hip joints really can tolerate extreme loading. However, they need to have the nice strong muscles to be able to do what they do. 
and they need to respect the bony anatomy. Not all of us have got this ideal bony shape and if we don't have the bony shape, perhaps we shouldn't be pushing the hips to those extreme positions. And pain is not related often to the structural change in the joint. And finally, we need to avoid complete rest. So we keep them moving at a, you know, they might have mild pain, but we actually keep all those pain-free activities in there. And I'm just going to finish off with this last slide, and I really love this because this is Val, who is our latest um, ambassador for the partnership. And she's just about to go into the photo shoot, and you might recognise her from some of those photos that uh, came at the start of my talk. And she's doing some exercises before she does those extreme motions in her photo shoot. So she's doing a little exercise that strengthens up, it's a bridging exercise that strengthens up the muscles at the back of her hip. And this is her pre um, prevention. So she's being really proactive, doing some nice prevention exercises before she puts her body through such extreme movements. And thank you. Thank you very much, Sue Mays. Uh, it's interesting to me to sit here and see the other people in the room nodding their heads along with the things that you're saying. Um, I think dispelling a lot of misconceptions and some of the questions that are coming in online right now uh, are getting to, 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 uh, to dig in a little bit more about these misconceptions. So looking forward to the question and answer session. We've got one more speaker before that happens, but keep your questions coming in through the portal in the bottom. I'm now excited to introduce our final speaker, which is Professor Kay Crosley. Kay is a physiotherapist and director at the Latrobe Sports and Exercise Science and Medicine Research Group. She, she strives to make a difference by better understanding knee pain and early onset arthritis, and uh, I'm going to hand it over to you. Thank you very much. And I'm also going to start by uh, telling you about the poll. And um, what I want you to think about is um, whether you think um, pain medication or exercise is the most effective treatment for knee or hip osteoarthritis. So that's your job is to think about that. My job is to highlight, I think, the fantastic work that Sue has done and the collaboration between La Trobe and the Australian Ballet really helping us to understand how, um, how the ballet hip works, if you like, and how we can actually help to um, protect their hips and give them long um, ballet careers. And then also to apply that work to the general population. So most people who are here, socially distant in the room with me and um, all of you, most of you at home are not ballet dancers, and, but we all still get hip and, and knee pain and hip and knee osteoarthritis. So my part is to sort of take the fantastic work that's been done in the ballet and apply it to the more general population. So if we think about the average person who's aged over 50, we see that roughly one in three of those will get, will have hip or knee pain, and one in four people will get hip or, hip or knee osteoarthritis. And I'm gonna probably call that OA from here on in um, over their lifetime. So we know it's very, very common, and particularly once we hit about 50 years of age. So we've heard a lot about ballet and, and Jill mentioned sport, but is sport bad for our hips and knees? Well, we know that being physically active and, and participating in sport is really, really important. It's good for our mental health, our physical health, and for avoiding all of the chronic diseases that come around if we're not involved in physical activity. But we also know that sports participation is associated with risk. And as highlighted by, by Jill, if we do have a knee injury, then we will have a higher risk of osteoarthritis. And certainly it's the biggest risk factor for knee osteoarthritis um, is, in young people is actually having a knee injury. And if we um, look at the prevalence of osteoarthritis over time, so on our y-axis, on our vertical axis, there's a prevalence of, of osteoarthritis. And along the bottom, we have the different um, ages, and we can see that the older we get, the more likely we are to have osteoarthritis in our, in our knee. But if we've had a, a knee reconstruction, we can see that line is a lot steeper. And if we sort of highlight people who might be sort of 30 to 40 years of age, we can see that in the uninjured population, about 10% of those might have osteoarthritis, but about 30 or 40% of people who've had a knee injury will actually have osteoarthritis. So we know that the risk of having OA increases over time, but that risk is much steeper if you've had a knee injury. What about other sports such as running or sports as mentioned before, where we don't have contact and we don't have injuries. What we do know about um, load is that 
as Jill mentioned at the beginning, is that we need to have the right amount of load. So it's a little bit like the Goldilocks. If we have too much load, then we're likely to get an injury, we're likely to get osteoarthritis. If we have not enough load, then we're also likely to have osteoarthritis. So what we want to have is load, and, and we've also had highlighted to us how important it is to keep that load up over time. Um, and if we don't have enough or if we have too much, then we're more likely to have injury. And we see that in running as well. So there's no strong evidence that running itself causes hip or knee osteoarthritis. And what we don't know is if someone already has osteoarthritis, whether they should keep running. We don't know if it's good for you, a bit like we've heard with the ballet, to keep going, or whether in fact we should be doing a bit less. But what we do know is that running does have many, many health benefits. So it prevents at least 35 different health conditions, so brain health, um, diabetes, and our chronic conditions. So we know that sports participation is important and that the physical activity benefits certainly outweigh the risk of osteoarthritis, but we also know we need to prevent knee injuries. So what are the factors that increase your chances of getting osteoarthritis? Jill's already talked about some of these, getting older, unfortunately being a woman, and if you've got a family history of osteoarthritis. But what about some of the things you can change? So we've already talked about joint injury. We know that's important. We know that weight is important. So that the heavier we are, the more likely we are to get osteoarthritis. That's not just related to the load on the joints, but also related to the systemic effects of being overweight. And a recurring theme both from Jill and, and from Sue and from my talk is also muscle weakness. We know that having weaker muscles makes you more likely to get osteoarthritis, but also makes you more likely to have progression of that osteoarthritis over time. So what do people complain of when they've got osteoarthritis? Anyone who's listening at home who has some osteoarthritis will recognise these activities, putting on our socks and shoes, getting up from a chair, going up and down stairs, are difficult activities for us. But again, muscle weakness is a really critical part of this. So we know that if you've got knee osteoarthritis, you're more likely to have weakness in your quadricep muscles. And if you have hip osteoarthritis, you're more likely to have weakness in your hip muscles. And, and certainly that's one of the things that we've seen in the ballet as well. And in people who've already got osteoarthritis, muscle weakness predicts more pain and decline over time. So some of the other things that you might think about if you've already got hip and knee pain and some of the things that have been highlighted in the ballet are things like having less range of motion, inability to perhaps sit as comfortably or to lift your leg up, difficulty getting in and out of a chair, having weakness in your calf muscles, not just in the muscles that are affected around your hip or your knee, walking slower or shorter steps is a, is a frequent problem for people um, with hip and knee or OA, and also having reduced balance, and we um, heard about that earlier. So what can we do about it? We've heard about some fantastic results in the ballet, and it's very, very similar in the general population as well. We see that we've got this osteoarthritis treatment pyramid where the big base of the pyramid is where most of the evidence is. So most of the research tells us that education, exercise, and weight control, if you're overweight, is the most, is, has the most amount of evidence for it and it's the thing we should be doing most. After that, we have medication and some passive treatments that I'm going to highlight. And then thirdly, it'll be surgery. So education, exercise and weight control should be the first thing we do and it should be for everybody. Our second line treatments of medication, some of our passive treatments are our second line and also they're only for some. And our final um, treatment that we should be going for is surgery and very few people should be having that. So we know that most people in Australia don't actually use these best first treatments for, oste for osteoarthritis such as education and exercise. But we also know when people do understand about their hip and knee, they do have a better effect. Exercise has the most evidence of any treatment as I've already said and weight management is hard but it can help. So this slide highlights the, um, the different effects of the different treatments. And I've highlighted in orange three different types of exercise. So strengthening exercise, endurance exercise, or functional exercise. And you can see those three are all better than every other bar there, which is information, weight reduction, and medications. But you'll also see that the three are quite similar. So really, it doesn't matter what type of exercise you do, as long as you do something. So how much should you do if you're doing sort of physical activity type exercise? You want to do at least 45 minutes of weekly sort of sweating related activity and certainly even in people with very severe osteoarthritis they can get 70 minutes of, ex of walking a week so there's no reason even if you've got arthritis not to be doing physical activity such as walking. 
Resistance training is important to build up the muscle strength and you need to do that at least twice a week. It's safe to improve the functional capacity, and we've heard about that already, and to reduce disability in people with chronic disease. And you don't get more OA by being more physically active. We've heard about pain, and everyone says, well, it already hurts me to walk or to get out of a chair or go up and down stairs. Why would I do exercise? But we know that pain's okay when you're doing some exercise, as long as that pain's acceptable to you. So if you think about a scale of zero to 10, where 10 could be the most pain you could imagine, something around the two to five scale. And what we expect is after you've done your exercise, the next day, the pain should go back to where it was before. So some pain during exercise is normal um, and it isn't gonna damage your joints. So if we know exercise is so good, why don't we do it? There's a whole lot of things here and I think everyone can relate to those, lack of time, poor motivation, not seeing the results we want. But it's up to us, and I think we heard brilliantly this, this earlier today from Amber about taking charge of your own body, listening to your body, using techniques that work for you, daily physical activity being important, doing the best exercises, doing the physical activity. If you don't do them, they're not going to make a difference. So it's got to be coming from within. You've got to have the motivation yourself um, to be able to do the exercise and get the results. If we think exercise is hard, we know weight management is harder, but we know that if we do lose weight, we will reduce pain. And I think for some people, that's a really big motivator. Even small amounts of weight loss will improve your health and reduce your pain. And combining um, interventions, so eating less with exercising more, but getting support from your friends and your family, and possibly a dietitian if, if that alone isn't going to get you over the line. I'm gonna quickly go through medications so we can have um, tablets such as uh, paracetamol or ibuprofen. Um, they have very small benefits, but they don't really have a lot of side effects. Injections can have short-term benefits, but they do have adverse events and they may actually damage your joint over time and nobody should really be taking opioids. The passive treatments are things like massage, a walking stick or a brace, and they can provide some help, um, but they don't provide as much help as exercise and they're only to be added to the overall um, scheme of things, so to, sorry, added to the exercise, not instead, sorry. So I think now is the time for our poll results. Pain medication is at 1.6 and exercise is at 98.4. Fantastic. Smart audience Fantastic. out there. Fantastic, very yes. smart audience. Um, so I'm gonna highlight another research program we're doing here, which is actually delivering exercise and education to the public. Um, it was developed in Denmark and now it's available in Australia and we, we're training physios how to provide exercise and exercise therapy and education to people with hip and knee osteoarthritis. A couple of final slides on surgery as being the last resort, as we mentioned, the sort of two common types that we see for both hip and knee. The first is the arthroscopy, so the clean-up type operation. In the knee, there's no evidence it's better than any sort of placebo uh, treatment. And while the side effects are rare, they do exist. So most osteoarthritis guidelines around the world actually recommend against this procedure for knee osteoarthritis. Joint replacements are effective. It's where we take the ends of, the, we don't, but surgeons take the ends of the joint off and replace them with metal and plastic joints. They're big operations, they high cost, there's a long recovery, but they do work for people with severe OA. But interestingly, in people who have had this GLAD program and other programs like that, they can actually delay having joint replacement for a couple of years. Just gonna highlight some of the projects that we are still doing here at La Trobe, or we're continuing to do here. So we're trying to work out if running is in fact bad for your knees. We're testing the optimal rehab following surgery. We're doing research into GLAD Australia and injury prevention. And we're doing very similar in the hip. So we're looking at whether hip pain leads to OA, testing the best rehab, and looking at whether we can prevent hip injuries. So my final slide is just my take home messages, which I think also encompass everything else we've heard today, is the importance of staying active and staying strong, that muscles are really important to maintain our joint health. Physical activity has lots of benefits, more than just our joint health, and not everyone can be a ballet dancer, but we should all take care of our own bodies. So thank you. Thank you so much, Kay. And now we're at that point where we get to hear from you, uh, wherever you might be calling, coming in from. Uh, we had, I, I think, just over a thousand people register. So welcome wherever you might be uh, from all across Australia and around the world. 
uh, now the, the, the platform is open for you to ask these experts some questions. And we're going to start uh, with a question from someone in their 60s who says that they have hip pain, no signs of rheumatoid markers. Uh, the GP tells this person that the prognosis is basically about increasing levels of pain medication, not so much consideration given to physio or exercise. So they want to know, where do I turn? Case. Uh, shall I start? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> I'm sure Amber would have some very good ideas as well. Yeah, look, I think that's sort of the problem we have often is that even though we have this great evidence, uh, often not everyone is aware of the evidence. And so I think that sessions like this allow us to be able to tell people what the evidence is and, and let them know that in fact, pain medication should only be used sparingly. So they're only there to help you through flare-ups or to let you do specific activities, but really it's getting the muscles strong and keeping them strong that's really, really vital. And obviously I spoke very quickly and I apologise for that, but also things like getting better balance, coordination, all of those activities are really, really important as well and I'm sure Amber would agree with that. And then building on some of Jill's stuff is actually training yourself to be functional again. So if your hip starts to hurt, and you are having difficulty getting out of a chair, for example, you might start using your hands to get out of a chair, and then eventually you actually can't get out of the chair without using your hands. And then your muscles are just getting weaker and weaker and weaker. So it's, it's about getting strong, but it's also about training yourself to do the activities that you used to be able to do, but you need to be able to do that really gradually. And Amber's great example of doing really, really small movements but eventually she could dance Swan Lake. Now, most people could never dance Swan Lake, but you've got to start with the really, really small movements so that you can actually progress to the bigger ones. So my advice is um, find um, a really good practitioner who can deliver a program. GLAD is something that we do, but other people will do other programs and find a way that you can safely increase your strength and function of your hip and your whole body. I'm seeing lots of nodding heads, but did anybody else on the panel have uh, insights into this one? <laughs> No, Kay has covered it off Sorry, perfectly. Sorry, I spoke a lot. <laughs> nice work. Uh, this person is looking at current research in bone morphology in ballet dancers, uh, and they want to know, do you lean more towards the individual chooses dance or dance chooses the individual? That's a very good question. Sue. <laughs> so I think it's probably a bit of a mixture. I think um, obviously someone that has that ideal anatomy probably can do the movements with more ease than the people that don't. There's potential that people that don't have that ideal anatomy might get sore hips when they're younger and can't continue. But there's also potential that there can be some skeletal remodeling. So when you're in, before your bones fuse in that adolescent phase, the bones can be remodeled slightly. So I think it's a little bit of a combination of that as well. That um, with good technique training and nice strong muscles, you can actually help to develop the bones into a certain shape. That I'm learning lots of new words today. Skeletal. So when your skeleton starts to, it, it sort of, it's developing and growing and the bones are growing, but then there's a point when you reach after puberty where it stops and there's no further growth. So that time before the, the bones fuse is a great time for this remodeling to occur. Skeletal remodeling, okay. Skeletal. <laughs> and Amber, I, I'm gonna jump over to you next. And the question is what exercises did you particularly enjoy doing for your hip as part of your home rehabilitation? And also, which ones did you not like? They didn't ask that, but I do want to know. I think the ones that were really time consuming with a lot of repetitions and not much action, I had to be uh, quite patient with. So they, they were things like activating the TA and um, the pelvic floor exercises, and I had to do them a lot. It wasn't just like once and that was done the more I repeated them over the day because they weren't loading anything um, in a bad way. The, the more I did them, the better. So that was just a, a, a discipline I had to learn. I, I think the biggest um, help for a, an exercise I've had my whole career and from that time is the, um, the QF exercises, particularly four-point kneeling, which is um, it's quite a specific exercise that we do, but it targets that deep rotator and that was a big saving grace for me. We're actually, I think we're going to post the, we've got all the videos that we did uh, for World Ballet Day. I think we're actually going to post it on the website. So if anyone's interested in the ballet specific exercises, they'll be available. 
well. That sounds exciting. And, and, and what other advice might you give to young dancers about how to look after their joints? And I think probably Amber and Sue are probably most appropriate to answer this one. Mm. Um, well, it's very interesting what you were saying because uh, it is a really important time for dancers in that prepubescent period um, when you're very excited about your career ahead to really focus on the basics of your technique and respecting your natural bony anatomy. But there is that window where if you work carefully and um, you know, with the careful guidance of your teachers and physios, um, you can shape your muscles into, oh, they'll grow into a way that will suit ballet and it will make you the best version of yourself for ballet. So there is that level we can't change, but there's um, always room for improvement. And did you have any more to? Well, I thought someone might ask, you know, how do we know if we've got ideal anatomy? Um, you don't have to go and get an MRI. I think it's really straight if it depends on, you know, how you move your hips. If you want to be assessed, you could see a physio and they could measure your hip rotation. And it's often something that we might do as a screening before someone goes and does full time dancing, for example. But really, it's just learning where your end of range is. And we do a lot of education with, because um, dancers do love to sit in these, you know, side splits or these extreme positions. Same here. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I get or, it. Or, you know, really um, difficult <coughs> yoga positions sometimes for a long time. Mm. And I think we really educate them not, you know, they shouldn't be just sitting there passively for so long. Yeah. There's no point having this passive movement if you can't control it, if you can't move it with your muscles. Mm. So I think um, a lot of education on, because that's when it's that that age they spend hours yeah. in these positions, and it's important to have that range of movement. We really encourage people to train that, but there's a better way than just sitting in the side splits or beyond the side splits or some of the interesting positions that you see them getting into. <laughs> So I think, um, yeah, just use it, strengthening up the muscles at the end range yeah, is really, you know, so they can control when they take their leg up is really important. So it's about control, not passively. Yes. Yeah. And that probably curtails beautifully into this question, which is uh, asking about the, the role of stretching. So this person's asking about, Jill, did you want to jump in on the role of stretching? Uh, no, I think I'll defer to Sue with okay. that because the ballet dancers actually do amazing I uh, need amazing movement and people think that they get it with stretching and I know for a fact that Sue discourages stretching so she may be able to comment on that. Let's hear about it from both perspectives, both the dancer and maybe the non-dancer perspective because that's one of the things I think most people are taught in elementary school before you do any exercise, you've got to stretch first. Mm. Mm. So obviously with dancers, most of them do have the range of movement so they don't need to be doing it but certainly when you're younger and you're going through that growth period you do feel tight and so um, what we what we found was with the calf muscles all the dancers were stretching their calves all the time throughout class and it was probably a sign of their calves were getting tight that crampy feeling and so um, when we measured their range of movement, they actually had pretty good range. So we really felt that it was more about them being having poor muscle capacity. So the cars were getting tired, starting to fatigue and then cramping up. Mm. So we did a, um, a intervention where we got the dancers to stop the calf stretching and but just to keep strengthening the calves mm -hmm. and now I mean I never see a dancer stretching their calves anymore it's just something that they got out of the habit of and yeah. you know we'll get them to do a bit of self massage and free it up but they've coped really well with not stretching the calves they haven't lose their lost their range of movement mm -hmm. but I think the hips are harder thing to convince people out of yeah. So we're, we're not saying not to stretch, but we're saying perhaps don't do it in a really passive way and don't sit there for a long period of time, mm -hmm. but also strengthen at the same time. So there's you know safer ways to stretch or to get that flexibility. And then it depends on the body type because we do have, we've got the whole gamut, I think, in the company. It's mm -hmm. not, not all dancers have got this super flexibility, but we do have ones that are very mobile as well and, they love to stretch even though they've got loads of movement. So what about for that 60-year-old who had the question earlier, potentially osteoarthritis, they're going to go do ballroom dancing. What is the advice around stretching there? Jill can't get out of this one. <laughs> she does ballroom dancing. The, um, the evidence is pretty clear that stretching is not that helpful in terms of injury prevention. It's been done time and time again. Certainly the static stretching doesn't appear to be 
that helpful where you sit in an ex, you know a lengthened position for any period of time or it's stretched into a lengthened position there's certainly a, a shift towards more dynamic stretching that is going through ranges of motion to um, get towards the end range but with control but i'd have to iterate what sue said is by far the most important thing especially for the 60 year old is to get strong because and it's a strong at the end of range because that's what is going to give you the protection for your joint but also means that you often don't have to stretch your injury uh, prevention comes from your strength and the stability around your joints so how do you get strong that's an interesting question that's for the next panel <laughs> <laughs> i think there's multiple levels of getting strong but i think we chronically underload ourselves and we underload people who are older and this thought that you can do a little bit of walking or a little bit of swimming might be sufficient is probably flawed that we do need to be getting people to do it to be doing um, exercises with bigger weights I'm a big advocate for putting anybody of any age into a gym and actually getting some good weights we've got wonderful weight equipment here um, I think we dawdle about too much with very low loads, especially with people with injury, where we're, the person is frightened of the load and the practitioner is frightened of loading. And I think we need to think about and find practitioners who are going to be happy to prescribe bigger loads. Kate, okay, did you want to jump in there or are you? No, I completely agree. I think that um, like everything you want to start, sorry, from the loading point of view, you want to start with what people can do and then gradually build it. But I think that um, there's a lot of evidence now saying that getting strong, and it's not just strong, it's also the balance, but it's also the power. It's, um, you know, getting people jumping and landing and doing those dynamic activities is really important for bone health. It's really important for muscle health, stopping you falling, all of those things, you know. So I think we shouldn't be afraid of, of exercise is the important message. Well, and that gets to this next question, which uh, is close to my heart, is how do you translate this information, uh, this knowledge that, that you have, to people who are in recreational or uh, social dance, to the teachers, to the schools? How do we, what's the mechanism for us to be translating this cutting edge research and knowledge? I think it's not just to people who are dancing recreational. I think it's to everybody. I mean, we all are going to have joint health issues as we get older. We all have joint health issues if we have a period of unloading. Um, and I think there are, if there's an increasing effort to bridge the gap between research and, and knowledge from a group, STEM group such as this to back to the general population. But I think uh, the general population also has to be a little bit more engaged in, in learning about these, these techniques and these, this new research finding. But, um, we do have to work much, much harder at, at getting a translation through to people. But people coming to this sort of uh, sort of experience uh, shows that people, you know, we have we had a thousand registrants. Shows that people are interested and do want to know. And now you have to, as a as an audience member, go out and find someone who can help you. Find the practitioner who's going to give you. Uh, the same advice as we're giving you. If yeah. you tell five friends and they tell five <laughs> friends. Like COVID. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's also making it fun though. So I think, um, you know, it can be pretty boring if you're just going to the weight gym, doing the weights in the gym. And I'd have to put a plug in for the Australian Ballet, but we do run these adult ballet classes. And I think, <laughs> you know, and Jill does ballroom dancing as well, like dancing and to music yes. and I mean, it, it can, I think if you make something really fun and it's very social and you're in a group, I think it makes it a lot easier to exercise than doing it in isolation. Well, and that, you're just setting me up perfectly for these questions because <laughs> that's one of the questions for Amber is, is how have you been working out in isolation? What does that look like? What are you doing working from home? <laughs> but sometimes it looks quite funny because we have our small toddler running around and swinging off our makeshift ballet bar. Um, I've managed to turn our garage into a ballet studio and our company at the beginning of the isolation gave all the dancers a square of um, flooring that would be good to put on our whatever we had carpet or um, floorboards or concrete. So we've all been doing a daily class at home that our ballet staff have been streaming to us and doing it to the best of our ability. Um, we've all been 
put in charge of doing things safely and we have the knowledge as professionals to not um, do too many jumps or overdo things in a space that's not necessarily the safest. Um, we have a lot of conditioning work that we've been given. Um, our programs, we just continue those at home and everyone's got quite inventive with um, trying to replicate, you know, things like the reformers and the Cadillacs that we have access to at the ballet centre. Um, people have been using skateboards. I've been using my daughter's little tricycle with some therabands to replicate some resistance sort of um, work and a lot of, um, like weights and things. Luckily, my husband has some weights that I stacked on my legs today to do some soleus strengthening. So we've all just been very creative and tr in a way trying like new things that maybe we hadn't thought to do before. Um, I went to the oval to try and do a bit of jumping just to get the load through the joints, which um, we've all been quite aware that we're having three months of not doing our big Allegro movement so we don't I would wanna... have loved to have been at the edge of that oval watching you <laughs> just <laughs> lunge through the air. It was pretty daggy <laughs> <laughs> but it felt great just like dancing like no one's watching but um yeah we we're just trying to make sure we keep enough uh, load through our tendons and joints so that when we come back it's uh we're, we've got a long way to go but we're not we haven't lost too much condition. Excellent and uh yeah, I guess for people who are at home, is the Australian Ballet uh, providing resources? You mentioned they've got some videos of the resources. So are there things that people can be uh, grabbing onto? Yeah, so we've got the exercises that we give are really simple. Anyone could do them. Um, and we've got a few little progressions there and we did it for World Ballet Day. So we've got those and they really target all the hip important muscles around the hip. Um, but, you know, the exercises, you can do very simple things mm. at home and in the gym. I mean, really the key thing is to strengthen up all those muscles, not only around the hips, but also, you know, the calf muscles. Again, you're just setting me up so perfectly. <laughs> this person says, I've heard the Australian Ballet has had lots of success avoiding ankle, foot, leg injuries from doing single, laugh, single leg calf raises. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us more about this and whether it translates to the general population? Sure. So back in uh, the start of 2000, we screened everyone and you would ex think um, with all the amazing things that they do, that ballet dancers would have very strong calf muscles. So we're pretty shocked to find that uh, we tested them, so how many rises on one leg they could do and we're pretty amazed at how poor their calf capacity or their endurance was. So we, um, and we also noticed that the people we counted and the people that couldn't do 25 continuous rises in the previous six months had some form of ankle injury or pain. So we started implementing this uh, daily activity and uh, over three years we saw a substantial drop, about half of our injury um, dropped in that uh, three years. And then Really, since we've had that program in place, we do it every day, they do it, um, they continue on it, we assess it. We, it was the first thing that we actually um, assessed when the first day they came in and did class, the poor things had to come and get their <laughs> calf endurance checked. So it's something that they um, do all the time and it really has had a, a very large impact, not only on the number of injuries, but it's very rare for us now to have to operate on an, on an ankle. We've probably done five operations on ankles in the last 10 years, which is you know, far, far less. It's about an 80% drop in our surgery rates um, from you know, the previous 10 years. So it's really had an Im amazing impact. But importantly, the dancers actually felt that their performance was better. So they were the ones that came to us and said, we want to do more because this feels so fantastic. Our bodies feel stronger. We can Emma, jump higher. And was that higher. your experience? Put you on the spot. <laughs> yeah. I guess I should say yes. <laughs> no, I did. I actually, I've got the kind of muscle that's quite um, soft. It doesn't take a lot of, it hasn't got a lot of tone. And I, um, I think for me, I found that having that strength really, really helped me, especially for things like the, the, the last act of a big full length ballet when you've, very fatigued and you need your muscles to cope with sort of almost more than they have to in a performance like you need to build that up in the day so yeah that was a, a re-education I hadn't done any of those in my student training and then I added them in as a professional but I wish I'd started them earlier we should start it earlier there's your takeaway <laughs> Joe wanted to jump in on this question as well yeah I just wanted to highlight the fact that your calf ankle and Achilles tendon complex absorbs a lot of your landing energy. 
And so when you are doing running activities or, or jumping, that strength in and around particularly your calf is so important to unload your, your knee and your hip joint. And in fact, calf strength is actually one of the biggest predictors of falls. So if you have poor calf strength, you are more likely to actually fall as you get older. So there's a lot of reasons that we should be looking at foot calf strength. So um, more of us should be getting calf endurance testing. Yes, yes. And, and the foot's really important. I heard a really interesting talk by Karen Mickle yesterday, and she talked about the long toe flexes and the, the small intrinsics of the foot and how important they are in your balance. And Kay's talked mm -hmm. a lot about balance as being really critical. And so we know that your foot and uh, calf muscles are really important for that as well. I think this is going to shift gears a little bit, but the question is how do you monitor how a patient is progressing with their exercise and rehab program in the short and long term? So I suspect that there's a physiotherapist out there who's interested in this question. Maybe we'll pass it over to Kay. Yeah, look, I think the most important thing, and I think it reflects all of the conversations we've had, is to work out what does the person need to get back to doing? So if they want to get back to you know, ballet dancing, that's one thing. They might want to get back to any other form of dancing, or they might want to get back to walking up and down the stairs without pain. And you say, well, okay, how am I going to get you from where you are today to that point? And so it really is a very, very simple thing. You just assess their ability to do the next thing they would need to do. So if they want to be able to get out of a chair without holding onto their hands, the first thing is measuring their ability to get out of a chair with only like one hand or something like that. So I think repeated assessing of how people are going, and I'm sure you do it all the time in the ballet, is really important because then I think if the person or the patient is trying to improve their function and they can see they're getting better, then I think it gives them massive you know, enthusiasm for what they're doing and motivation to do the next stage. One of the big things um, as you get older and with a lot of the hip and knee osteoarthritis, it's the ability to get onto the floor and get off the floor, for example, play with grandkids, anything like that. And if, if you don't actually teach people how to do it and assess how they're improving on that, they're never going to be able to go from, oh, I can't get off the floor to I can get off the floor. So it's a matter of making small goals that are achievable and then assessing their ability to do those and then you progress them to the next one. I think a lot of us at work from home tomorrow are going to be paying attention to how we get up yeah, from our office chairs. Exactly. And then it's whether you can get out of the chair where only on one leg. Okay. Well, <laughs> and if you get to a point number? where you can get out with no legs, then <laughs> you're levitating. The magic number is 22. You need to be able to get out of a chair on one leg 22 times. Okay. That's your challenge, challenge. right there. Exactly. <laughs> 22 times 22 one leg. 22 times. All right. I'm going to start with one. Uh, this one's uh, also for Kay. Uh, how does one become a dance physiotherapist? And I think maybe this is actually it's for Sue. For Sue I think. Sorry. That says for Kay, but it's yeah. for Sue. Okay. So my path, I was doing ballet, loved it, did it full time for a few years, actually thought I might have um, liked to be a ballet teacher and then I had an injury and discovered physio. Um, and I think having that ballet background is really very useful, but we've had fantastic dance physios that haven't had that background. Um, I think what you need to do is to really spend a lot of time in the studio and with the dancers to see exactly what they do. But I think I'm so, proud of um, how many fantastic dance physios we have in Australia. And the great thing is, unlike anywhere I think in the world, we actually do some really fantastic training. So we've got the Australian Physio Association that has a d um, dance chapter and they have um, education all year round. And we also, through La Trobe, all the students come and get trained through us. Anyone that's interested in dance comes and does some um, their clinics, their third or fourth year placements, and then we do master's training as well. So I think we've got a fantastic, we've really trained through our company and through this university, so many fantastic dance physios. That's brilliant. And um, that is a really rare thing worldwide. Um, and La Trobe certainly has a strong reputation for physiotherapy, so uh, it's nice to have this connection and the partnership. Um, does the Australian Ballet, and maybe other people on the panel have ideas for this as well, have a general warm-up and stretching routine available for community ballet schools to implement for teen dancers to avoid injury and shift the focus from sustained passive stretching? Should I take that? Yeah. <laughs> yes. So <laughs> I think the key thing is to warm the body up first. So, I mean, we've got every dancer's ex by the time Amber gets to even halfway through the career, she'd already worked out what works best for her. There's, everyone has a different approach. So we have 
so, um, a lot of dancers that might ride bikes in to really warm up the body. There's some, some that come in and spend a good hour in the gym doing some strengthening exercises, but nothing too much that they fatigue the muscles out. So really, they'll work all the muscles around the body, especially those key ones such as the calf and the hip muscles and the back. And they'll, you know, really warm up those muscles and make sure they're ready to fire once they get into class. So that's pre-class and is yes. it post-class? Is it the post -class, same? Post-class, then they'll do the heavy resistance. So they'll get on the big gym machines like you see behind us and they'll do some really heavy weights. You know, less of it, but um, much higher weights to build up that true strength. Excellent. Well, you answered two questions in that one, so okay. that's perfect. <laughs> um, there's a question that came in first before any of the questions, and I, I think we might... Uh, it'll be our second last question. Uh, this person says, I'm a 60-year-old woman with uh, osteoporosis. I'd like to keep uh, on exercising, but find when I perform high-impact exercises such as jump squats, jumping jacks, et cetera, I have knee and hip pain. What options do I have to gain the same benefit, such as increased heart rate and fitness? Also, in parentheses, this person indicates, I have an incredible euphoria uh, when I experience these types of high-impact exercises. <laughs> So I'm guessing this is probably a K or a Jill. Well, I, I think it would be, they sound amazingly active, which is the first thing. And it's fantastic because jumping is so good for osteoporosis. One of the things that we know from bone health is it's really important to do very short sessions of jumping. So maybe they would need to, instead of doing 20 or 30, we know that the bone responds best to perhaps five or 10 repetitions. So fewer repetitions um, uh, spread throughout the day might be really important. Um, but the other thing would be to really look at the strength around the hip and the knee joint because they're doing very high impact exercise. But if you don't have the strength, then that might be the reason for the pain. And a lot of people think that doing the exercises gets you the strength. And in fact, what we find so much with injury and with people who have pain is that it doesn't. You actually have to get the strength to do the exercise. Mm -hmm. So it would be worth thinking about the repetitions and how many times they were doing it, but also maybe get somebody to assess whether they have a good strength because we know that if we have good strength around, around joints that we can actually limit how much pain they have. So some uh, advice to think about out there. Uh, thank you for your question. We're going to end on one final question. And Amber, I'm going to have to ask you to keep it brief. But this was asking about whether pregnancy had a noticeable impact on the hip joint instability. That's interesting. Do you know what? It actually didn't. But I did have to do a lot of work coming back. And it was all the same um, work I'd done previously. Um, I did feel you know, looser around the pelvic area for sure in my sacroiliac joint. But um, all the same program that I've done my whole career helped me um, put that all back together. So very fortunate to have that rehab. Excellent. And it's a great way to bookend it. You started it. You ended it. Thank you so much to our panel, uh, to the events team who've put all this together, especially to, uh, to you, the audience. We've got people all the way from Belgium joining us. And so thank you for joining us tonight, taking time out of your day uh, to learn a little bit about the Australian Ballet, about La Trobe University. Uh, I hope you learned as much as I did. Um, to find out more about our cutting edge research happening at La Trobe and with our partners, the Australian Ballet, visit latrobe.edu.au ballet. From me, Latrobe University, thank you and have a wonderful night.